السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله so this is now session five of the Halaqa book club uh, with Nawa books and uh, with myself the translator uh, Mahdi Locke so I, I'm going to be conducting and moderating today so I ask you all to make lots of du'a for uh, Ustaz Jalal al um, He has a throat infection, I believe, or some sort of oral infection that is not allowing him to speak. That's very painful for him. So please make du'a for him. Uh, inshallah, he'll be, uh, yes, oral viral infection. Get my facts straight. So please make du'a for him. Um, he's not able to talk. So I'll, I will conduct it, inshallah. Um, and he will participate via the chat box and inshallah he'll help me out with the Q&A. So the format, uh, as per usual, the format is inshallah, I will talk about the Imam's book, uh, read out some sections and summarize for about 30 to 40 minutes. And um, yes, my Allah, I'll give you a swift recovery, a swift and thorough recovery. Ameen, Ya Rab. Um, I will talk for about 30 to 40 minutes. And then after that, we will do a q and I'll open the floor up for Q&A uh, to take any of your questions uh, regarding the text. So today, inshallah, we're going, going to uh, cover from page 45, I think up to maybe page 55, around there, inshallah. But I'll start on page 43, which is a new chapter, because that's where we started last time, or we finished last time, I should say, just to... Uh, refresh everyone's memory and then we'll take it from there so the chapter we're looking at um on page 43 of the book man and allah's justice on earth and then sanu uh, which is available from nawabooks.com this chapter is called no consideration is given to the contingent matters of this worldly life meaning we don't give any weight or uh, consideration to the contingent matters of this dunya, i.e. these tempor temporary, temporal issues of uh, matters of this dunya. And what we mean by this, or what the imam means by this, is that these are not how we measure happiness and success. Okay, we, we, we don't look at material things like wealth, like luxury, like opulence, the various worldly arts and exploits. We do not use these as our measure of success in the dunya. Well, this person is very, very wealthy. This person has a nice big house. This person has a nice big car. This person has a private jet and a yacht and whatnot. Therefore, this person is very happy and successful. We don't, that's not our, that's not our standard. That's not our measure. Because as the Imam explained before, and we were discussed this in previous sessions, really we want to look at the state of a person's heart. How, how close are they to a law? How content are they with a law? Right. Because again, someone can be, someone can have all those things, all those signs of wealth, all those signs of luxury, but they could be constantly stressed, constantly anxious, constantly worried about their wealth, about, <coughs> excuse me, about their next business deal or whatever it is. And therefore they don't have peace in their life. Whereas the person who is poor and blind and disabled, and you might think, oh, this person's miserable. This person has a horrible life. This person might be content with what Allah has given them, and therefore they are they are happy. They're actually content, right? They're not stressed. They're not anxious, despite the situation they're in, despite the what we see on, on, on the outward of the hardship and tribulation that they're, that they're going through. So, uh, and then also on page 44, the the imam talks about um, how this, this, this is how the Muslims, and we're talking more about this today, this is how the Muslim, especially the companions, the companions, when they came out of the Arabian Peninsula and they were able to defeat and overcome the greatest superpowers of that day, which were obviously the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. They defeated them. Now, the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, they had all the wealth. They had all the opulence. They had all the money. They had all the, the physical dunyuli trappings. They had all of it, whereas... The Muslims, they had what well, they had their faith in Allah. They had their faith in Allah and their devotion to Allah, not just their faith in Allah, but their devotion to Allah. They had their worship. And, and this is where we're going to see this um, expressed beautifully, absolutely beautifully in a statement that, um, that 
uh, Sayyidina Omar ibn Khattab, ibn Khattab عنه, that he gave to Sa'd bin Abi Waqas before the Battle of Qadisiyah. That's coming up in a few pages. So the, the Muslims always understood that it was their nearness to Allah and their devotion to Allah that gave them power and strength. And this is something as well I, 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 I talked about at the end of the last session where we talked, uh, and I was referring to a, a, TV, a TV series that Imam Abulti did called the Qadim al or Asal the Qadim al like what are the secrets or why is it that certain nations advance and then some and certain nations regress and certain nations decline and so on. So what, what are the reasons? And he, and he put it down to, he put it down to, Adab and in or akhlaq and in. So you, you, you had to have you had to have good manners and you had to have in. You had to have, have, have a have a a desire to, to to learn knowledge, like true knowledge, and again understanding for, for, for Muslims that ilm, ilm is true knowledge. It's it, it means adraku shayin kamahiya fil is is to understand something as it truly is. Okay, which is not it, it which is not. Because we don't have, again, we don't have a word for science, right? we got to remember, when we think about the Western world, they use this word science, and they want you to think that science is something that is absolutely a definitive and proven and decisive. But under that bracket, under that label of science, they slip in a lot of other things, a lot of things that are merely theoretical, merely hypothetical, merely uh, guesses, and they're still being researched, they're merely theories, and so on and so forth. So it's a them. This is something that a nation needs. And then on top of that, we have adab, we have akhlaq. The people have to have good manners. They have to have good character. Because if they have, if they don't have good manners, they don't have good character, how are they going to work together? How are they going to trust each other? They can't trust each other. You can't build anything. You, you, can't, you can't build a, a family. You can't build a business if the people involved don't trust each other. They don't trust each other. If that, that doesn't work at that level, how is it going to work at the level of, say, a country or a nation? It doesn't work that way. So Imam Abulti, so what Imam Abulti goes on to explain the series, he says that you know, many nations throughout history have, have, have succeeded without religion or without Islam. They've achieved this, right? The Romans, the Persians, as we, as we just mentioned, uh, the British, the Americans, they've achieved this. But for the Arabs in particular, the Arabs didn't have any, didn't have, did not have either. They did not have adab al amongst each other. They did not have, and, and Islam gave it to them. It's through Islam that they achieved this. So this, so this is why on page 44, we have the famous statement of Abu Khattab where he says to Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, he, he says, Nahnu qawman Islam. We are a people that Allah made mighty with Islam. That's what we are as the Arabs. We're a people that Allah made mighty with Islam. If we desire Izza, we desire to be mighty and powerful, with something other than Islam, Allah humiliates us, right? Because Islam is, is, is like the ladder. It's, it's the ladder that the Arabs climbed up in order to reach these levels of akhlaq and, and these, of, of manners and morals and, and science and knowledge. That's how they sent that, that's how they got up. It was Islam, right? If they if they toss that ladder away, then whew, back down they go. They don't have there's nothing else for them to fall back on. So this is a very, very important point. Now Imam Abulti goes on to continue, and he says that, the, so the Muslims, it was their faith and there was their devotion to Allah, and this is how they created, right, from Mecca. So he, so he says, for example, Mecca, from which the Islamic conquest started, and, from, and it was from there that the Muslims conquered these lofty pal uh, palaces in Babylon and other places. Mecca itself was a desolate valley, no abundant vegetation, no beautiful buildings, right? The Muslims, were, it, it was nothing to do, again, it was nothing to do with worldly things. Mecca was just a simple place in a desolate valley, no ostent uh, ostentatious buildings, no grand architecture. But from there, an army is leaving, and, 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 uh, or from this, from this area, this army is leaving and taking over the, the, the superpowers of the day. And then he says, the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from whose legislation a towering civilization extended across the known world at the time, right? So it's from his teachings that the Muslims went out <clears throat> and they built massive cities, they built universities, they built institutes of learning, they produced all these incredible ulama that we, that we all know about. He himself remained an unlettered man, right? Again, it's, it's not about that. You see, it's not about, oh, I have to read and write. No, no, no. Look at where it starts. It's all, it all starts with the faith and the devotion to Allah. So he says here that this is how things were for, the, for, for some time. 
that the worldly life was conveyed to them and they subjugated it to a law's rule. So the way of his religion, authority of his legislation, without any of that being attached to their egos. So this is this is a really, or let me complete that sentence, without any of that being attached to their egos or taking over their hearts. So th th that's a really crucial point. As Muslims, we don't have a, a blanket objection to wealth. There isn't a blanket objection to wealth. If you look at Christianity, for example, uh, and, and Christians amongst themselves differ, like some of them will say that wealth in and of itself is a bad thing. Just it's bad to be wealthy. It's worldly to be wealthy. It's worldly to have money, okay? Then you have, uh, and you might find them among some of the Eastern churches. Then you have the, the complete counter argument especially amongst a lot of the Protestant churches, where they're going to say that wealth is a sign of God's favor upon you. That's a belief they're going to put out there. This is the Protestant work ethic, Max Weber, these people. You know, if, if, if you're working hard and making money, this means God loves you. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> they're both wrong. Humbly love, they're both wrong. The, 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 rea the reality is that for our understanding is there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. The, the position is, where is your heart? in all of this. That's the, that's, the, that's the key thing. Where is your heart in all of this? If you can have wealth in your hand, but not in your heart, then that's good. And you use that wealth for good things. You use the wealth. And this is what we talked about last in the last session. We talked about how wealth can be, um, like being patient with wealth and being grateful with wealth, I should say, is more of a test than being patient with poverty. Because if, 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 if you're poor and you don't have the means to do evil things, do sinful things, well, you, you have no choice but to be patient because you don't have the means. You don't have the means to mess about with different things. You don't. Whereas if you're wealthy, you do have the means to do any wickedness that you want to. If you want to go to any wicked place, you, want to, you have the means. You, have, you can afford it. But can you control yourself and instead... Use that wealth for the halal. Use that wealth for what Allah loves. Use, a, use, that, use that wealth for what Allah, what will please Allah, and thereby show gratitude. That's the greater test. That's the greater test. So that, that's, that's the key thing here about wealth. Can you hold that wealth in your hand, but not let it come into your heart? Um, but he says, but then he goes on to say, the Imam says, but when the, the love of this world penetrated their hearts, and then they started to compete. And then they started to go for worldly things. And then what happens? And then that creates division. And then Muslims weaken. And then this is what happened in Andalusia. This is what happened in the Abbasid Empire. And then the, the unbelieving empires and the unbelieving powers, what do they do? They're like, they're like vultures. They sniff. Like, ah, there's weakness. There's disunion. And then they sweep in. Right? Again, if you, if, you, if you read the history of any, any sort of, you go through the history of Islam and you look at, if you look at the, uh, like the Crusades, for example, the first crusade, when the Crusaders first arrived in, um, in Jerusalem in 1099, in the Gregorian calendar, when they first arrived, they, they didn't meet like a unified Muslim force. The, the Muslims were, 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 were very much divided at that time because you had the Fatimid Shiites ruling Egypt. You had the Hashishin cult stirring up pro problems in, in Sham. Uh, and you had lots of internal problems because this, this is the nature of it. You have to, this is again, the overall rule. You have to defeat your internal enemy before you deal with your external enemy. You have to look at your internal, it's, it's, it's again, there's a quote uh, by Imam Ghazali from Imam Ghazali in, in the in the, Ihya, in the book of Tawheed with Tawakul. He says, before, before, you deal with, before you deal with the dog outside, you have to deal with the dog in the house. Before you deal with the dog in the house, you have to deal with the dog in your heart. It's always the internal enemy that's the problem. And if you read and if you read the history of, for example, Salahuddin Layubi and Nuruddin Zengi, and, you, and there's this massive period of time between 1099, when the Crusader forces arrive in Jerusalem and slaughter everyone. It's a horrible massacre. And then Jerusalem's not recovered until 1187 of the Battle of Hattin. And this is eight, this is 88 years. It's like, well, what's happening in that time, in this 88-year gap? You find you, you you look into this. You find the Salahuddin Ayyubi and Nuruddin Zengi are cleaning up the Muslims. They build. They start off by building madrasas everywhere, all over Sham, all over Egypt, and then they raise an army from the Tulabla, the students of knowledge, 
who've memorized the Quran, they know their fiqh, they know their creed, they, they fast, they pray, they do night prayers, they're knowledgeable, devoted people, they become the army. And then Salahuddin Ayyubi takes them, takes over Egypt, removes the Fatimans from power, makes that a Sunni stronghold. al Azhar becomes a Sunni institute, takes care of the Hashishiyin and Sham. And then they move on on the Crusaders, right? They dealt with the internal enemies, the internal problems first. So, but when people start, what we am talks about here is when people start uh, getting to that stage of power, right? Back to my original point here is people are, are working towards the original, people are obeying a law and they're getting success and it's working out for them is when they lose sight of why they're doing this, that they go out from power. So, so this, is the, this is a key thing to understand. Um, and for those of you, who, any of you who are teachers, <clears throat> you might know about the difference between objectives and outcomes. Objectives and outcomes, right? Like if you're doing a lesson plan, you have like learning objectives and you have outcomes. Like this is what I intend to achieve. And this is kind of what I expect will happen. So for us, power is an outcome. To, to, to be in a position of political power or to be in a position of wealth is an outcome. It's not an objective. Our objective is to please Allah. Our objective is to please Allah and call people to Islam. If we, if we call people to Islam, and we call people to believe in Allah and to obey Allah and to be devoted to Allah and to worship Allah, then the natural outcome of that is that, yeah, we, we, would, we would have supremacy. Islam and the Muslims would have supremacy. They would have power. They would have authority. They would have wealth. That's the outcome. It's not the objective. But if, if that becomes the objective, and therefore Islam is merely a vehicle, right? When if Islam is just a vehicle and a means towards getting power and wealth, well, then there's no blessing in that. And Allah does not give you, to, give you success. So, so, so this is what the Imam is saying, is that, pe- that as, as long as people are, are their, their focus is Allah, then the wealth and, 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 and the power, that just comes alongside with it. It's just, it's just, it's just like a, a natural occurrence. It just happens, right? Whereas if the wealth and the power becomes the objective, no, it goes all wrong. And this is what happened in Andalusia. This is what happened in the Abbasid Empire. Uh, and it happens throughout uh, history. So what does this all mean? So he says here, what well, this all means is that Islam in its pure essence is the origin of power. Islam is the origin of power. You want, that, that's where it comes from. We have to start obeying Allah. And this, is, this just isn't at the level of nations. It's also the level of the individual. So the, the lesson for, for us as individuals, it's like whatever trouble you're going through in life whatever struggles you're going through you know whether it's with, with your job or with your work with your family with illness whatever the salute the solution is to go back to Allah the solution is okay well what how am I falling short uh in my worship to Allah like start with that assessment am I praying all my prayers on time am I praying five times a day okay and then you have to ask yourself, okay, how can I improve it? Okay, so I'm doing my basic obligations. Okay, but how can I improve it? Can I go to the masjid more often? Can I try to go to the masjid five times a day? Okay, if I'm doing that, can I go to the masjid and be there on time? Maybe I go to the masjid, but maybe I come late. Maybe I missed the first rakah. I've gone got, I've got to this habit where I missed the first rakah, the second rakah. Can I improve that somehow? And, you, and you're always, because again, you're always looking for ways to improve your relationship with Allah. Now, that doesn't mean don't get me wrong here. That doesn't mean that you start obeying a law and worshiping a law that your world, pro- your worldly problems just go away. No, your problems will still be there, but you're going to be so much more powerful in how you deal with them. Because you're close to a law, you're going to have so much more patience. You're going to have so much more forbearance. You're going to have so much more wisdom as you deal with these problems. And you have so much less stress and anxiety because your heart is attached to a law. Your, your heart is attached to worshiping him. Your, your heart is attached to being with him. All these problems will uh, not what will start to pale in comparison to how they, how you saw them before. So that's the solution. You want to sort you want to you want to sort your life out. He's like like I, I need I need to achieve things in life. I'm my, I feel like I'm fulfilling my potential. I feel like I'm not doing I'm not I'm not the best person I can be. Okay, well start with your Islam. Start with your worship. Sort out your prayers, sort out your fast, sort out your dhikr, sort out your, 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 your recitation of the Quran, sort out your daily du'as, and build on that. 
Um, and then things will happen. So the, the question that, that, that comes up, so then, he, so then he talks about, so the first reason is that Islam is their origin of power. And then, um, yeah, sorry. What does this all mean? It means it's not, not the origin of power. And then why? Because peop, peop, people ask these questions as to, uh, okay, in that case, then why, why do these nations of unbelief, okay, so why is it that, say, for example, like we're Muslims, but then you have these people who like, you look at the Americans or the British or the Russians or the Chinese, and, well, they're not even Muslim. They don't pray, they don't fast, they don't even believe in the laws. Why do they have all that wealth? Why do they have all that oil? Why do they have all that military might? Why, 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 why? And what the imam goes on to, to explain is the first thing he says is that they're not a measuring stick. Again, we have to stress this point that having wealth and power and so forth, that's not a measuring stick of Allah being pleased with you or being successful or being happy and so forth, right? It's not, that's not the metric stick. And he quotes several ayats, um, a good one, I don't quote all of them, but like for Surah Al-Imran, the third chapter, verse 196, 197, do not be deceived by the fact that those who disbelieve move freely about the earth. Don't let, that's the ghurur, don't let, don't let that deceive you. It's a brief enjoyment, then their shelter will be the fire, they'll be in the nar. And then those disbeliefs not imagine the extra time to grant them is good for them. This is Surah Al-Amran, I-178. Don't, don't assume this. Do not imagine this. And there's several ayat like this. And then the Master of Allah saw some, and then we have the Hadith as well, the Master of Allah saw some passed by young, uh, a dead young billy goat in the market. And he took it by the ear and he said, which one of you would like to have this for a durham? And they said, we, we don't want any part of it. And he said, well, what would we do with it? And he replied and said, by Allah, this world is lower in the sight of Allah than this is to you. So don't be uh, deluded by that. Just because just you see the unbelievers with wealth and power and might, like, oh, they're, they're, they're favored by Allah. No, that's not the case. That's not the case. And, and, the, way, and the, way we have to, the way we have to balance this out, and this is, again, in Imam Abulti's book, uh, Minhaj al-Hadara, right? the, the, the approach to civilization, the approach to human, human civilization in the Quran, is... The, the way, the way to, to view this world, the way to view this dunya is to see it as very short and insignificant, but it does have a certain value. And he says you should, you should view it the same way that you would view an exam. Okay, so, so if you're thinking of like, like your, your final exams at high school or your final exams at university or maybe your driving test or something like this, right? The test itself is very, very short. The test itself is what, an hour, two hours, and that's it. Like com compared to your entire lifespan, it's, it's nothing, it's two hours of one day. But, but the effects are profound. The effects are profound, right? The result of that exam is, is longer lasting. So that, that's why you have to see it. So, so when, 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 you're in your, when you're in your exam room, you're not gonna get diluted by or distracted by things around you like, hey, that guy has a nice hat. Ooh, she has a nice handbag. No, no, that's not the point. That's not the point of the exam. When you're in the exam, what do you want to do? You want to focus. You want to be, you don't want to be distracted. And and, and I mean, if you think about it, an exam or you you can get you can get stressed, right? So sometimes an exam or you can get stressed if if you if you see someone leaving early, right? I'm sure you've had that feeling where you're, you're sitting in an exam room and you see someone leave half an hour earlier, you're like, oh man, how did he finish so quickly? Oh no. He's smarter than me. It's like, okay, you don't, you don't know though. Maybe he left early because he's finished and he's got all the answers correct. But maybe he's finished early because he's stumped. He doesn't know what else to do. Maybe he thinks, oh, I don't know the answers. I can't do any more. I'm just gonna leave early. You don't know. So don't worry about him. Focus on you. Focus on your test. Don't get distracted by the things around you. That's how we have to view this. Um, then he says, uh, he goes, so he goes on to talk about, he says that the blessings and amenities of this world were the path to having a strong empire and united Ummah that is protected against the ambitious, this is page 49, uh, top of page 49, and united Ummah that is protected against the ambitious designs of aggressors, the Muslims, under the leadership of their prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the rightly guided uh, Khulafa, would have obtained the greatest share of their blessings, uh, of these blessings, and... And they would have moved about freely in, in vast 
uh, moved about freely in luxury and vast sustenance. If that were the case, but they did not, right? So, so if, if that if that were the case, the measure if that were the measure of it, that oh, to, to be wealth and have wealth, if, if that's the measure of it, then the Muslims would have gone out and, and taken all the wealth, right? The the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and 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 the Khulafa al Rashidun Sayyidina Abu Bakr Sayyidina Omar Sayyidina Uthman Sayyidina Ali. And they would have gone out and, and taken all the wealth. They would have built massive castles and palaces and whatnot and all this opulence and, and gold. And, and it's one of the things, it's one of the things that uh what's his name again? Uh Bernard Kohler. Um, he's a German econ economist. He wrote a book called Islam and the Birth of Capitalism. Very interesting book. Um, but he talked about Muslim trade and he and he constantly refers. This, this, this guy, he's not a Muslim, but he, but he, but he, I think he believes he speaks Arabic and he researched the sources. And he, and he said, he said the prophet, he said the prophet وسلم, was actually a very wealthy man, but he gave it all away. He had, he had no attachment to it, right? He, he, he amassed massive wealth through, 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 through the campaigns, through the, through the military campaigns and so forth. He had a lot of wealth, but he gave it away. He had no attachment to it. And again, this, this, this backs up what the Imam Bolti is saying that, that none of that stuff is. A sign of success and a sign of lobbying please you don't need that stuff the sign of success is where your heart is with Allah so so said so the nations of Persia and Rome had all the splendor and the amenities that you know about whereas the message of Allah so I saw them three months would pass by and no fire for cooking would be lit in his house three months would go by he passed away and he was never satiated from bread and olive olives uh, bread and uh, bread and oil sorry bread and oil twice in one day very, very simple life. Very, very simple life. No attachment to, to genuine things. And this is why, again, when, when, when people came from outside Medina to, to see the Meshav Allah, they didn't know what he looked like. They couldn't identify him from a crowd. They couldn't pick him out. They didn't have anything to distinguish him. The same thing with uh, the Khulafa after them. They, they, they would be found, like oh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar, they'd just be found outside somewhere. They wouldn't be in some palace. They might be sleeping under a tree or relaxing. Right? No, 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 none of these uh, dunyawi things. Um, and then he goes on to say about how, about how they they, just, he, they destroyed the fortresses of the, of the enemies, um, but their life was rugged. It was very, very rugged. And then we have this story on page 50 of Utbah ibn Ghazwan. Utbah ibn Ghazwan said that he, he, he said in one of his public addresses, he says, I saw myself as the seventh of seven. I saw myself as the seventh of seven with a master of Allah. So I saw him. We had nothing to eat apart from tree leaves until our jawbones became ulcerated. I gathered a cloak and split it between Sa'ad, Sa'ad and Malik and myself. I wore half and Sa'ad wore the other half. This is, this is the minimum they have. They have very few clothes, very, very few little food. He said, today, today, because so he's talking about how it was in the past, he said, today, there's not a single one of us except that he has become a ruler over one of the major cities. So we came from being completely what they call in English dirt poor, we're eating leaves. We're having we're, we're, we're having to share cloaks and rip them in half to, to, in order to cover, cover ourselves. We're in this state. But today, there's not a single one of us except that he has become a ruler over one of the major cities. And then he says, I seek refuge in Allah that I be great in my own estimation and small in the sight of Allah. Right? That's a heavy statement. I seek refuge in Allah and I'll do that. I see refuge in law that I be great in my own estimation. Now that I see myself as like, oh, I'm, 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 I'm this big ruler now, right? I, I rule over a city. I have power. I have authority. I have wealth. I have people under me who obey me. Ooh, look at me. And he said, I seek refuge in that, that I be great in my own estimation, but that I'm small in the sight of Allah. And Allah sees me as nothing. Allah sees me as pathetic. Allah sees me as just being vile and dunyui. Now I'll do that. And he said, then he says, he says, there's never been any prophethood except that it came to an end and was eventually replaced by kings. Right? This happens. And I said, you will test the rulers. You will test the rulers uh, after us and be tested by them. Right? There will, like, there will be rulers who will come and you will test them and they will test you. That's what happens. Don't, don't get comfortable. Don't think that this is, this is great. It's all, no. You always have to be on your guard against things getting into your heart, things getting into your soul and making you think like, oh, look what I have, right? Because that's, again, the dunya is not, because again, as Muslim, we're Muslims. The dunya, the dunya is not our final abode. It's not our resting place. 
the paradise is. This is just our stopping point. This is here for a short period of time. We're here uh, to, to lay our seeds for the hereafter, to plant our seeds for the hereafter and make the most of it. And then the next life is for comfort. This, this, is, not, this is not how we measure comfort or how, where we seek comfort, where we seek happiness. And, and this is why the message of Allah, so someone says, and he quotes this hadith, give, give glad tidings and raise hopes of that which pleases you. For by law, I do not fear poverty for, poverty for you. So the message of Allah said to us, I do not fear poverty for you. He said, rather, I fear that this world will be spread out for you as it was spread out for those before you. And thus you will compete for it as they competed for it. And it will destroy you as it destroyed them. So again, this stresses, this is again, this message of Allah, so I'm stressing that point that patience with poverty is a lesser test. The greater test is, is showing gratitude when you're wealthy. So I, suppose I, don't, I don't worry about you being poor. I don't worry about that. I worry about you having so much wealth that you start to compete for it. You compete for the world. You compete for the dunya. And then it destroys you just as it destroyed people before. You. That's what I fear. So, so then he says, so, that, so what does that mean? It means that the Muslims having being poor or being backward or having a bad world, they say that's ne- that was never, ever, uh, that never prevented them from reaching the highest ranks of power and victory. Right? That's not that's not how we look at. It. We don't we don't say oh well, we, we don't we don't have all the money that the Americans have. We don't have all the resources that those people have. How are we going to do it? So that's not the point. That's nothing to do with it. We want we want to change our state. We need to get back to uh, we need to get back to Islam. That's how we get over the state. It's not it's nothing about the uh, the signs and, and trappings of wealth and power. Then he goes on to talk about um, the miracle, right? Is, and as he uses this word in some page 51, talks about the miracle and of, of how the Muslims, because this is what this is what the Westerners call it. They call it the miracle. Of how did these bunch of ragtag Arabs from, from the, from the uh, uh, with, again, with uh, ripped clothing and very little wealth, how were they able to, quote unquote, burst out of the Arabian Peninsula and take over and defeat? the two greatest superpowers of their age. How are they able to do this? So the Westerners called it a miracle. So Imam Abulti puts him in a footnote. He says, these Westerners, they call the Islamic conquests a miracle because they do not understand these divine standards and laws. They don't understand the, 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 this, the sunnah that Allah has laid down. They don't understand these, right? They think it's all about material wealth and it's, it's all material. Term. They don't understand this. The issue remains difficult for them to justify and analyze. They just don't get it. They don't understand. Like, how, how could these people just? They they didn't have all the they didn't have the weapons that the Romans had. They did not have the horses. They did not have the equipment. They didn't have any of these things. But they beat the Romans and they beat the and they beat the Persians. It's a miracle, and they call it a miracle because they don't understand. He says, "As for us, we know that the issue is connected to a law and a system that are prevalent at every time and place, but their first statute." of these laws and, 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 and systems is faith in a law along with affirmation of his book and the sunnah of his messenger. So Allah, they was them. This is a really, really crucial point. And this is why um, uh, there's a book that inshallah we're, we're going to be working on uh, in the not too distant future, inshallah, uh, with now my books. There's a brilliant book by Mama Bolte called Sunnah Nilahi Fi Ibadihi, right? Allah's sunnah regarding his slaves, regarding creation. Right? There are sunnah, there, 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 are, there, are, there are laws, there are, there are kawanin, there are laws that Allah has <clears throat> that don't change, that are fixed. And we're not, we're not talking about ahkam, these are not rulings of, in terms of like halal and haram, but, they, but they, are, they, are, they are sunnah of how Allah treats humanity. Right? If they do this, Allah does this. If they do that, Allah does that. And so uh, in his book, Imam al he, 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 he goes to the Quran and he lists about 25 or 26 of these. And it's very, it's just, I wouldn't say very, it's just unbelievably eye-opening. We understand how the world works in that way. And inshallah, that, that's, that's in the pipeline. Inshallah, make the law for us. Um, so he says, so, that, so that's the first reason to understand of, of why, you know, you, you, you look at the, uh, the unbelieving nations, or why, why do they have power? But again, that's not a sign of Allah being pleased with them. The second reason, the second reason is that the Muslims today are not the Muslims of yesterday. When Allah granted them the miracle of the conquest, they are not those whom Allah promised grant victory and support. He says, rather, t- today Muslims are a rather astonishing specimen. Again, we have to look at ourselves. He says, 
a lot of us are, are taking on, I said, or a lot of Muslims are taking on Islam just merely with expressions and slogans, but then not actually implementing the rulings. Okay, and and this 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 is a sad phenomenon. We do we do have people nowadays who um, uh, they do this thing called where they identify as Muslim, right? They identify as Muslim, right? It's like a, it's like this, like this weird identification culture we have now, right? Especially in the West, right? You can identify something without being a thing. A man can identify as a woman, a woman that can identify as a man, and so on and so forth. People identify as Muslim. It's like, okay, but that's not how a Muslim is defined. A Muslim is defined by what he or she believes. That's not how you know just identify as a Muslim. I can identify as a cougar, it doesn't make me one. So he goes on to talk about, he says, the, the, there are people they complain about Islam, Islam's values, its structures, its limits. Uh, and they say, well, it's, it's not, it's, it's behind the times and so forth. And they say, well, they're not really following Islam. They're following their own version of Islam. And then they're asking Allah to give them success. Like, no, you, 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 you have to obey the Islam that Allah revealed. You have to obey what Allah revealed in his book and on the tongue of his messenger. So Allah, it's not for us to, to change that and say, well, I don't really like this Islam. I'd rather have a watered down version. That's really easy to follow. And then it becomes meaningless. So. This is, the, this is the point I'll finish on. It says, however you might ask, uh, this is a reason why law, this is a reason why law has abandoned the Muslims, okay? So, so if, a, if a law has abandoned the Muslims, he's not helping Muslims because the Muslims at, at a collective level are not obeying him and they're not turning to him and they're not establishing the Sharia, they're not establishing Allah's commands. But the question is, why has Allah ex the exalted assisted their enemies in every field when they at any rate are worse than the Muslims, right? Because the Muslims can say, okay, yeah, okay, we're sinful. We fall short. We're not doing what Allah's command us, but look at them. They're not even Muslim, right? Look at look what they do. Look at all the wickedness they do. Why, why do they uh, why, why do they have this power and this authority and this wealth? And the, what, why? And the answer is Allah's standard practice necessitates that the world keep moving with its people. So again, this is a really important one. This is about one of Allah's sunnah. This is a really, really important point. And he says here that the Muslims and the, and, 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 and the disbelieving nations are like two sides of a seesaw or of a scale, right? If one side goes up, one, if one side goes up, the other goes down. So the, if, we, if we look at, say, the Americans or the British or the Chinese or the Russians, or wherever, wherever it gets into this position of like world domination, they're not there because they have something over the Muslims, right? Like they, they have something that we don't. No, 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 no. They're there because Muslims, as you go on to read it, the Muslims have, have simply abdicated. They've abdicated their authority, right? So, so, if, so if the Muslims don't obey what Allah has, has commanded and they don't fulfill it and they don't do what Allah has told them to do, then, they're, then they lose that position of authority and someone else has to take over. Someone else has to take over. And, and, and they're not in the position because they're better. They're simply there because we're not doing our job. You know, and I don't remember when I was translating and I read this and I, and I was trying to think of like, a, like, what's a good analogy for this? Like, how would you explain this to someone? And I, and I remember, because I, I've, I've been an English teacher for a long, long time. And I remember one time when I was in Jeddah, I had a student, um, a very, very hardworking student, mashallah, very, very hardworking student, uh, and he always had to leave class to answer his phone and stuff like this because he had to talk to his mom and, and uh, work was calling. Um, he was a university student. And, and then I found out, because he did a presentation later on in the semester, and I found out that um, his dad had passed away. So, so think about this analogy. So his, his father passed away, Rahimahullah. His father passed away when he was young. He, this boy was maybe 12, 13 when his dad passed away. And when I met him, he was maybe 20. Um, so... His, his, his dad passed away and then he had to become the man of the house, quote unquote. He had to become the man of the house. So he had to start doing things to provide for his mom, to take care of his other siblings because he was the oldest son. And, and, you know, he had to grow up, as they say, he had to grow up very, very quickly. So he's, so he's doing a great job. I'm not going to, I mean, he's doing a great job, but is, is he the best person for the job? No. So he, he's not there. You have to think he's not there because he's the best person for the job. He's there because the dad isn't. That's all. Well, someone has to step in, right? If the dad's not there, some, who, who, someone, ha someone has to do the job. Someone has to run the house. Someone has to look after the mother and the kids. Someone has to. So he did. So that's how we have to look at this here. 
whether it's the Americans, the British, the Chinese, whoever, they're not there because they're the best people for the job. No, 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 no. They're there because the Muslims are not. The Muslims are not taking up that task. The Muslims are kind of basically abdicating their authority. They're chilling out. They're relaxing. They're trying to get comfy. They're trying to find, they're obsessed with worldly things or whatever it is. Like the Master of Law someone said in that had even quoted earlier, right? They're, they're drawn to worldly things and they're competing over them. So it's an abdication of authority. It's an abandonment of their responsibilities. So we will touch on this, inshallah, I think next time. So because we've reached the 40 minute mark, I do not want to keep it too long. So I think from 54, uh, we'll do that from next time, inshallah, where we talk about contemplate this divine standard practice. So I will, I will say that as the end of this session, inshallah. And I will now open the floor for Q&A. والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله